<clears throat> Thanks, everyone. So we are thrilled to have the OSIRIS-REx sample collection here at NASA's Johnson Space Center. And we look forward to the exciting discoveries that are going to be made by the science team with those samples. Over the next six months, the curation team and the science team are going to be working closely together to develop a sample catalog that, once released, will provide an opportunity for scientists around the world to request material to study venue in their own labs. For now, the curation team is hard at work, carefully and meticulously disassembling the hardware, containerizing asteroid material, and documenting everything they do every step of the way. All of this work takes place inside of a glove box, and those glove boxes are necessary to keep these samples as pristine as the day that the sample landed in Utah. Now, as you've heard, we have a bounty of sample on our hands already, and we're not even inside of TagSAM. The views here are amazing of the sample, and they're only going to get better. Now, as you can imagine, working with hands inside of a glove box within a clean lab is hard, challenging work, and it does not go quickly. But we need to do this right. And in fact, we have a lot of heritage of this working really well to keep samples pristine over multi-decadal timescales. If we just look at our Apollo collection, uh, the samples that were returned in the late 60s and early 70s when humans first went to the moon, to this day, we still get hundreds of sample requests and allocate hundreds of samples to answer questions that we didn't even think to ask at the time that those samples were returned. This is the true value of sample return and of curation and keeping these samples pristine. It allows us to answer questions that would not be possible with the technology uh, of the time. In fact, like all of our Astro Materials collections, the OSIRIS-REx collection is going to be conserved so that scientists that aren't even born yet are going to have the opportunity to answer questions about our universe with these samples using technology that has not even been invented. This is the legacy of OSIRIS-REx and of sample return broadly. And now let's hear some of those science results from the science team. Thank you, Francis. Next up. Okay, so I'm going to ask being an interesting question here. Serve as a venue rock sample. Cost to preserve the NASA venue rock sample is not explicitly stated in the research resorts. However, it's important to note that the Cirrus Rex mission, which collected the sample, cost more than $800 million. The sample is kept in a temporary clean room set up in a hangar on the training range, where it is connected to a continuous flow of nitrogen. This nitrogen purge keeps out earthly contaminants to leave the sample pure for scientific analysis. The sample will be studied for decades to come and about 70% of it will be set aside for future analysis by scientists equipped with new lab technology and techniques. Therefore, while the exact cost of preservation is not specified, it's clear that significant resources are dedicated to maintaining the integrity of the sample for current and future research. So, yeah, um, that's kind of interesting. They don't know how much it's going to cost, huh? Yeah. Uh, I would imagine that this 800 million is probably already approaching, if not already, over the billion mark. And then they're talking about how they just have a temporary clean room. Um, to preserve the rock sample from Apollo. The exact cost to preserve the Amalo Moon Rock sample is not explicitly stated. However, the preservation process is quite extensive. The samples are stored in secure, pressurized cabinets filled with pure nitrogen. To handle the samples, one must use stainless steel tweezers or Teflon gloves. All these measures are taken to protect the 382 kilograms of rocks, core samples, pebbles, sand, and dust lifted from the moon during the six Apollo landings from 1969 through 1972. In terms of the cost of the lunar sample return, one estimate suggests that in 2019 U.S. dollars, the total program cost per total mass of rocks was approximately $458,115,000 per kilogram. This calculation was based on a total program cost of 175 billion and a total mass of 382 kilograms. It's important to note that these figures include the cost of Apollo missions themselves and not just the preservation of the samples. Well, that's kind of curious. Why wouldn't there be data available for just specific costs, just specifically tied to just the preservation, okay? The actual cost of preserving the samples would likely be a fraction of this amount 
but is still likely to be significant given the importance and value of these samples. For instance, a bag containing a trace of moon dust from Apollo 11 sold at auction for $1.8 million. Okay, did any of y'all get any royalties from that? So they're selling moon dust and pieces of broom rock. Um, the American taxpayers are footing to bit the bill to preserve this moon dust and rock and all this stuff that from, you know, decades ago, right? And the, the guy in the video says um, that they're still selling samples to this day, okay? And that was a video that was put up today on October 11th of 2023. There is a character during the NASA's Flying Rock show that makes the statement that they are still selling samples from this moon rock, supposedly, okay? And the one sold at auction for $1.8 million. I would imagine that the cost of preserving these precious samples would actually be quite extensive. I think it's very interesting that the search results and the AI couldn't get me a fixed number to a specific question of how much to preserve it. There should be data available. I'm sorry, it's not just a fraction of this amount. And guess what, folks? All over again, we're gonna do it with venue all over again. I just think that it's very curious that after all of these decades, okay, so far they've only been able to provide us with data according to the AI that calculates the total program cost of $175 billion. And we're to believe that the cost that we have been incurring every day with the nitrogen and all of the, the, the steps and everything, the clean rooms and everything that's required to preserve these moon samples, right? And we're to believe that it's just, it would likely be just a fraction of this $175 billion. That's what we're supposed to believe, right? And now that we've got this new flying rock show, this new Osiris Rex mission thing, that's already most likely more than a billion. So, and we're gonna keep it on, you know, nitrogen, right? We're gonna keep it on ice, so to speak, and keep it preserved for decades to come. So there you go, folks. Talk about generating an income, okay? I'm sorry, and I don't mean to offend anyone who's a NASA fan and anyone that's that's playing along with this and you're all excited about it. I have I mean no disrespect to you and I mean don't mean to offend anyone. But do we really want to invest this much money and this much time dedicated to something like this? Seriously. I'm just it's just too much for me. NASA has made so much money off of the taxpayer dime, investing in all of these different programs and all of these different projects and things. And now they're asking, they're going to be asking for more money because not only do we just have, you know, the moon rock samples that we've been preserving for decades that we're paying billions of dollars for. Now we're going to have these, you know, venue rocks. I'm just, I'm, I'm over it. And to me, that video that they presented today says so much. They say so much with so many words, and it doesn't take much just to read between the lines. These people, they have some of the, the smartest people, supposedly, okay, spending their time looking at dirt that I'm willing to bet decades from now is going to be proven to be bullshit that came from Earth or from some laboratory somewhere. I'm, You know, there are ways to test samples where they can actually pinpoint exactly where a mineral or some kind of a precious metal of some kind was mined from. There are ways to do it. And if we're to believe that technology is going to advance to a level that there will be people examining these pieces of rock using new scientific technology, finding things that we've never imagined that we would ever find before, I guarantee you within the next decade, it will be exposed that this material most likely came from someplace here on earth and was created in some kind of lab somewhere. Okay. Because there is no way in hell that Lockheed Martin built some kind of fucking craft that could go and chase down this flying space rock, land on it, gather up a bunch of dirt and rocks, and then bring it back here to Earth. And if you believe that, that's fine. Go ahead and believe it. If that's your bag, you go ahead and dig it. But myself personally, I think this is just another one of those projects that is just going to be 
another one of those things where NASA is going to build billions of dollars from it, but they're going to spend pennies on a computer program and bullshit rocks from Earth. Okay. And again, because I'm repetitive, I have to say it again. I mean, no offense to anyone who is a fan of this stuff. But for the love of baby Jesus, y'all, um, $800 million could do a lot of good for the actual issues that we have down here on this planet, okay? And when you add it all up, I guarantee you it's more than $175 billion for this entire project, including all of the, with all of the moon rocks and core samples and stuff that we're preserving with nitrogen. I'm just, uh, this, this money could be best spent elsewhere. I'm just saying it could be spent in better ways. I'm just saying. We have Professor Dante Loretta, the principal investigator for the SciStrikes program. All right, thank you, Shaniqua, and thank you, Administrator Nelson, and to uh, Dr. McCubbin. I just want to start out by saying what an honor it is to be on stage here talking about the amazing results. And I want to talk to the young people in the audience, because NASA, for me, when I was a kid, was always like a guiding light, like a dream. To work for NASA meant to be part of the best of the best, to be at the forefront of human exploration. And to see this dream coming true today is beyond words for me. And to see this dream coming true today is beyond words for me. And to see this dream coming true today is beyond words for me.